Grace, I'm really glad you are back, and congratulations. I don't know if you're going to share with everyone your Sea Grant um, funding, yeah. because we were working really hard at the end of the fiscal year to help her get a few more tag shark, uh, tags for her sharks. But uh, I think she's got that worked out, so we're very, very excited. Um, I'm going to let Grace tell you a little bit about her uh, adventure getting to where she is now doing Tiger Sharks at Buck Island, but I have a question for the group, and I think it's going to be a surprise. How many people in this audience have actually either been on a boat that's caught a tiger shark or helped catch that tiger shark? Raise them high. Grace, come on, you gotta put your hand in the air too. <laughs> That's pretty outstanding. Um, I wanna thank my team for their efforts making this happen with everyone, including our lizard interns, Danielle and Aaron, our new technician, Kristen, our old technician, Nathaniel. Yeah, there you go. Um, our volunteer, Rick Starr, actually caught, was on the boat with uh, Greg and uh, was it uh, DeAngelis? And, uh, that caught our first tiger shark at Buck Island. So they're there, it's very cool. So Grace is gonna talk uh, uh, quite a bit about um, what she's discovered out there. Okay. And um, thank you for joining us, coming back in from the field. Did you have any luck today? Uh, we caught a couple, they got away from us, so no more tags out today, but tomorrow, tomorrow is a new day. Couple tiger sharks. Caught a lot of reef sharks that we put some external tags on. Perfect. Yeah. Grace, please tell them about your um, study. Of course, yeah. Thank yeah, thank you, Zandy. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you guys about the research that we've been doing out in Buck since 2013 with uh, a whole bunch of different sharks that live in the MPA. So yeah, I'm really excited to get to talk to you guys. It's, it's not every day that I get to give a talk to people that are uh, familiar with my study area since I'm a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts, which is a pretty long way away. Um, and I've been working uh, with Sharks and Bucks since 2015, and my advisor, Greg Skomel, started studying sharks down here in 2013 and brought me on as a master's student, and then I've been able to stay um, and continue working on them, specifically working on tiger sharks as part of my PhD. Um, before we sort of dive into talking about Buck Island sharks, I want to start out talking about shark populations in general. Um, globally speaking, most sharks are, uh, their populations are declining. Uh, up to 76% of shark species are either threatened with extinction or uh, data deficient, according to the IUCN Red List. And data deficient just means that we don't have enough information about those species to really know whether their populations are in trouble or, or not. So there's a lot of information that we still need to learn about sharks all over the world. And it's important for us to learn these things about sharks because they're a really important part of our marine food web. So uh, most sharks or a lot of sharks serve the apex predator role, which means they're up at the top of that food triangle and they help regulate the population sizes of all the other fish below it. So if we take the sharks out at the top, we might get a big explosion of mackerel, which will lead to a decline in herring because the, herring, or the mackerel eat the herring, and then maybe an explosion in our small crustaceans and everything gets out of whack. So it's really important that we keep these sharks around in our marine environments. And the reason that sharks are in trouble is because of how um, biologically they live their lives. So their life history can't sustain heavy fishing pressure and that's largely because sharks live for a really long time and it takes them a long time to mature. And once they do mature and are reproducing, uh, they have very few pups, uh, which is what we call baby sharks. Baby sharks are pups. So in comparison, a yellowtail snapper can lay about 1.5 million eggs a year, but most female sharks will have 20 or fewer pups, and they'll probably only do that every other year, sometimes every three years. So that's a dramatic difference when we look at a fish that can be um, more or less fish sustainably because they have lots and lots of babies every year. Uh, and the other big thing is that uh, sharks are losing habitat. So a lot of sharks are coastal sharks, and they will use what we call nursery areas for their young to develop in. So uh, usually close to shores, sheltered areas, 
uh, shallow water where big predators can't get in to eat the little sharks, um, and the little sharks will have lots of food to eat. So think mangrove coastlines or nice sandy shallow lagoons like we have uh, wrapping around buck. Um, and also losing habitat because, uh, so we're, the sharks are losing habitat because of coastal development as well as damaging fishing practices. So things like trawling um, or running your boat across a seagrass bed. So what can we do to help stop these population declines? Well, one thing that we can do is implement fishing regulations. And especially in the Caribbean, we look towards things like forming marine protected areas. And when we start talking about forming marine protected areas, it's important that we put those marine protected areas in places that are important to the sharks or it's not going to matter. If they don't use those spaces, having a closed area an area that's close to fishing isn't going to make a difference. And it's also, before we start forming new MPAs, important to look at the existing MPAs that we already have. And so Buck Island is an existing marine protected area that could be providing protection to sharks with its habitats. But before we started our work, we didn't know. And so the whole concept behind a marine protected area is that you have this area that's close to fishing, where the habitats are nice and healthy, we're not taking fish out of this area, those populations will grow and grow and grow, and eventually they'll move across the border into areas that are open to fishing to help keep fisheries alive and functioning, because fishing is important for us too. So overall, um, sharks in the Caribbean are pretty similar to population trends globally. Um, most shark populations are declining, and there's generally lower biodiversity of sharks in the Caribbean uh, compared to other uh, tropical areas around the world. And a study conducted in 2010 found that in the greater Caribbean, South Florida, the Bahamas, and the U.S. Virgin Islands had the potentially had the highest remaining concentrations of sharks. Uh, and there have been lots of studies of shark biology, habitat use, movement patterns in South Florida and the Bahamas, but there really haven't been very many studies of sharks in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, my advisor, Greg, has been part of a couple studies in St. John and St. Thomas in the early 2000s, and no shark research had happened in St. Croix until we came down here in 2013 and started our work in Buck. So we wanted to study uh, shark habitat use in Buck Island Reef National Monument to see uh, what habitats were important to them, what species were there. We weren't entirely sure because no one had done a whole lot, any shark research down here before. And what we did was set out to try to tag and track sharks in Buck to determine how they were using the marine protected area. And we did that using a technology called acoustic telemetry. And the way acoustic telemetry works is it functions on a uh, coupling between an acoustic tag and an acoustic receiver. And so we will put a tag in a shark, and I'm going to show you the steps in our tagging process on the next couple of slides. And then once we have that shark tagged, we have all of these receivers out in the water anchored at different places, and those receivers are constantly listening for those tags. So anytime a shark swims by a receiver, it'll send out a ping and the receiver will register that and we can track the shark from place to place based on the tag number that shows up on that receiver, the date and time associated with that detection, and then we know the location of the receiver because we've anchored it in the water. And so that's how we connect our dots, collect our data, and learn where the sharks are going. And so in order to do that, you have to catch and tag sharks, which is a pretty fun thing to have to do. Um, so we fish for our sharks on baited long lines, uh, which are just long ropes with hooks that we bait with nice stinky fish like barracuda. We leave it in the water, wait for a shark to catch or to get hooked on the hook. Uh, and then we uh, pull the shark into the side of the boat and we'll secure it safely to the side of the boat with that hook that's in its mouth and then a tail rope around the tail. And then we'll start our surgery process. So a lot of the sharks that we're tagging are pretty big. So we do that with them in the water, like you can see with this nurse shark. And we do our surgeries abdominally. So the tagging, we do a little surgery in the abdominal cavity to put the tag inside of the shark. And that's because these tags have a 10-year battery life. 
And it's really hard to keep a tag on for 10 years when it's on the outside of the shark. And we want to get as much data as we possibly can from these guys because as they grow, they might start using different spaces. So it's important to be able to get as much information from the lifespan of that tag as possible. And so we make a little incision in the abdominal cavity. We insert the tag, which is a little bit hard to see in this picture, but here's what it would look like on a tiger shark. Uh, the receivers are about that long and about the width of a dime. And then we stitch them up and we let them go. And there's a tiger shark swimming away from our boat after we've tagged it. And here's a cute little Caribbean reef shark swimming away from the boat after we tagged it. So most of the sharks swim away strong and they'll swim throughout our acoustic receiver array and their tag will be pinging and our receivers will be listening and we can track them from place to place. And so we've had um, receivers with the Park Service out in uh, the monument as well as in East End Marine Park and out off of Lang Bank uh, for since 2011, I think, when the first ones went in. Um, and the array has grown and changed in numbers. And today I'm going to talk to you about tracking sharks in 86 of those receivers that were out. As you can see, most of them are within the boundaries of the MPA, but we have three in East End Marine Park and five going out along the continental shelf drop off in Lang Bank. And they're spread throughout a variety of different habitats, and that lets us track a bunch of different sharks and maybe determine what habitats are more important to different species. Is that what the scrust is, the receivers? Uh, yeah, so each dot here is a receiver, and it's color coded by different habitat types. Scrust, oh, each dot. yes, each dot is a receiver. And so the green dots are seagrass, the blue dots are colonized pavement. Uh, the pinkish dots are colonized pavement and sand. The purple dots are linear reef. The red dots are patch reef. Uh, yellow dots are sand. And then scrust, the orange, stands for scattered coral and rock in unconsolidated sediments, which is far too long to fit in a figure legend. <laughs> um, Nate, at the, the peak of our array, we had how many receivers out there? What was the total? I think 130 some. Uh, 134 is the number that drops into my mind. Yeah, it was. It's massive, and it's, it's going to be taking a little bit reduction soon. Yes. And it's a huge amount of work to maintain these receivers. So I, I want to give a quick shout out to all the MPS people here and and past that have put in a lot of work for that. We wouldn't have this data without them. So by the numbers, since 2013, we have tagged 48 sharks in Buck Island of four different species, Caribbean reef, nurse, tiger, and lemon sharks. The largest shark that we tagged was 10 and a half feet long, and that was a tiger shark. Uh, she was a mature female. And the smallest shark that we tagged was a one and a half foot long lemon shark that was probably just born. And we've accumulated over 3 million detections through 2019. And that number, there's a download that's about to happen, so that number is going to grow as we get more data from those receivers. So of the, those 48 sharks, um, we got, had enough data from 33 of them to do really rigorous analysis and get to learn what's important for these sharks. So I'm going to talk to you today about 12 Caribbean reef sharks, 10 nurse sharks, 6 tiger sharks, and 5 lemon sharks. And I'm going to talk to you about all the different things that we can do with acoustic telemetry data. We can look at something called residence time, which is just how long the sharks are staying in Buck Island Reef National Monument. So that's sort of a first step in getting to know how important this marine protected area is to the different species. High residence time means they spend a lot of time there, and that means that's is probably an important space. It's the place where they live. Low residence time means they don't really live there. They're maybe just passing through. We can also look at habitat use from this tracking data. So I showed you that map with those receivers anchored in all of those different habitats. We can, we can look at what habitats they spend the most time in. And then we can also look at how those sharks get from point A to point B. So how do they travel? What paths are important for them? What spaces are most important for them? 
So I'm going to start out talking to you about the residence time. Um, so here we developed a residency index, which is basically just the percentage of time that the sharks stayed in the MPA. So um, I just took the number of days that we heard from them divided by the number of days that we could have possibly heard from them based on how long the tag was out, and that gives us a residency index. So lemon sharks here are in yellow, nurse sharks are in red, reef sharks are in purple, and tiger sharks are in orange. And as you can see, that residency index for all of those species is above 50%, which is pretty good. That means those sharks are all spending more than 50% of their time in the marine protected area, so it must be an important place for them. And we can then break down that residency time to, or that residency index, and look at how that might change throughout the year. Are the sharks there more often during one time of year than another? So up on the top here, we have our lemon sharks, then our nurse sharks, our Caribbean reef sharks, and our tiger sharks. And as you can see, there's again, there's not much change in those bars aside from the tiger sharks that have a little bit of a drop down in May and June, which is funny because that's when we used to catch them until we came down on this trip in November. Um, so yeah, the sharks more or less are using Buck Island year round. And then I just wanted to point out this really interesting thing that I was able to find from residency index. And this red, these red bars here are uh, residency index for a nurse shark. We tagged two mature nurse sharks in Buck uh, over our years of tagging. And those two nurse sharks leave the MPA during June, July, and August. And as you can see, for more or less the rest of the time, so each bar here is a month from May of 2015 to May of 2017. And they're there basically all the time, except for this time period here. And this is just a residency index from one of those mature sharks, but the other mature shark looks the same way. And we know from other research that nurse sharks reproduce and mate every other year. So based on this, we didn't capture that 2018 period of time. I need to still dig into that data. But we suspect that these nurse sharks are leaving because they're going somewhere else to mate. And this co corresponds to the right time of year for when nurse shark mating has been observed uh, coastally in Puerto Rico. So there may be some other place in St. Croix where nurse sharks are aggregating to mate that we just haven't found yet. Um, but clearly Buck Island is their home because as soon as they're done, they come right back and they stay there every day. <laughs> so the next thing I said I was going to talk about was habitat use, so I'll just circle back to this map where all of our receivers are located and all of the different habitat types and colors. And what you can do with um, looking at all of those detections is look proportionally at where sharks are detected on receivers in relatively in each habitat. And so then I made these fancy graphs of all the habitats that are important to them. Um, so up here, we have our nurse sharks. Uh, the yellow is sand, the green is seagrass, the purple is linear reef, the red is patch reef, the pink is colonized pavement and sand, the blue is colonized pavement, and the orange is our scrus. Um, and so you can see here that sand and linear reef are really important habitats for those nurse sharks. Uh, nurse sharks are mainly associated with bottom types, so sand probably feels nice and soft on their belly, and the linear reef might be a good place for them to find shelter, um, either from crashing waves or just to hide out during the day, maybe wait for a nice fish to swim by and eat. Uh, then up here we have our lemon sharks. Uh, sand is less important for the lemon sharks here in Buck. They really like linear reef. Um, they also like seagrass and they like that scattered coral and rock in sandy areas. And then down here on the bottom we have our um, Caribbean reef sharks and they like sand a lot too. Um, I, actually, I'm going to back up for a minute. So I should have pointed out that these arrows here are showing movements um, between the habitat types. So you can see that most of the uh, nurse shark movements, this big yellow arrow, are moving from sand receiver to sand receiver. 
whereas we have a lot more crisscrossing happening here with the Caribbean reef sharks. So they like to move around a lot more. Even though they spend a good amount of time in sand, they're going back and forth between lots and lots of different habitat types. And we see a similar pattern here for uh, our tiger sharks. Lots of movements back and forth between different habitat types, but again, a preference for sand. Um, so that sand is really important. Some of our sand receivers are in quite deep water, so it may also be showing a preference for deeper water, particularly with our larger sharks. So one of the last things that we can do with acoustic telemetry is look at how the sharks like to go from point A to point B and see if maybe there are differences um, among individual sharks and if that corresponds to different sizes. Uh, so we have, these are both lemon sharks. Again, we have all of our receivers pointed out. Those are the gray dots. And the receivers that the sharks used have a halo around them. So all of those yellow halos you see are receivers that sharks have shown up on. Um, and just to kind of give you orientation for what the bottom is like here, this receiver line traces the continental shelf drop off through Buck. And then out here is Langbank. And so relatively small lemon sharks, which are what I have up here on the top, they're about three feet long or so, uh, like to move around a lot more. So they spend, space around, they spend time around the island, but they also are making these interesting exploratory journeys out to the deep water. Uh, and I'm not quite sure why they would want to do that, because they're small and they could get eaten by the big tiger sharks that we know are out there. Uh, but, but they do, maybe they're, they have a little bit less fear in them. Uh, and then we have larger lemon sharks down here, about six feet long, and they like to swim around Buck in circles and circles and circles, and then occasionally they shoot out here to Langbank, and then they go back. And these two lemon sharks that do these, excuse me, that do these movements um, have been tracked in Buck since 2013. So we tagged them on their first tagging trip, uh, we've been tracking them up until now. Their pingers are still working. Uh, and all they do is swim around that island in circles every single day. So it must be a little bit boring, I think, but they seem to like it here. Same direction? No, no. Yeah? How come the pingers there at the boundary line didn't light up? With the okay. Yeah, so um, these lines aren't accurate in terms of like right. they the. Don't go straight. Yes, yeah, of course. So we only know that they went from here to here. We don't know how they got there. They could have gone all the way through here. They could have gone down and around. Yeah. So this is just representing connections between point A and point B. How close is it to take? Uh, about 200 meters. Oh, wow. It depends on the bottom type. So 200 meters is, is 200 to 150 would be expected for sand. It gets smaller on linear reef um, because it's, there's more structure. So when it comes to the nurse sharks, we actually got to see really interesting changes in movements as these sharks got older. Uh, so we start out up here with, with small nurse sharks about four or five feet long. Uh, and then as they grow, become seven or eight feet long, uh, we see this big expansion in space use. So those nurse sharks up there really like to hang out in the big coral stacks north of, north of the island. Uh, and then as they get bigger, they start venturing out uh, to the deeper water, to that shelf drop off. And by the time they're nine feet long or so, they are using the majority of the receivers that we have out in that deep water around the shelf, shelf drop off. And those are our, our two big mature girls that I talked to you about before that are, that are leaving to go reproduce that, that do those movements. One of the things that I think is most interesting and exciting about this, this project is what we've learned from Caribbean reef sharks. So we don't know a whole lot about movements of Caribbean reef sharks. There have only been a few other studies done on them uh, in the Bahamas and in Belize. And so we were tracking 12 Caribbean reef sharks and we found that uh, they start to become territorial when they reach around two years old. 
So we tagged a bunch of small young of the year, which means they were just born less than a year old, and one year old Caribbean reef sharks. And they all like to stay really close to the island and they just track more or less back and forth along this nice linear reef up here. And then all of a sudden they hit age two and they spread out all over the place. And so we have examples of four or three other Caribbean reef sharks that were over two years old. This one really likes to roam around, but uses this bit of the shelf a lot more than all of the others. This one really likes to dominate the northern shelf, and this one dominates our southern receivers, and they don't encounter each other very often. That may be because they chase each other off, uh, they don't get along with each other anymore. It may be that they're uh, resource partitioning, which means that they're dividing up the amount of food that's available for them. So they're staying in places where there's enough for them to eat. So that's, that was four sharks. This is two sharks. I'm, so what I'm doing is showing examples of movement patterns that we had. So I couldn't show you. So we have seven littles that do this movement pattern. And then uh, the other five are bigger and they all use different space, but I couldn't fit all of that on one slide. <laughs> but the question I had is each one of those uh, drawings is, is, is one shark. Yes, yes. Are they all female? No, we have males too. And different, different migration patterns? So, so most, almost all of the sharks are immature, and so you wouldn't really expect to see differences in movements between males and females when they're not mature. Um, it depends on the species. Um, Caribbean reef sharks uh, mature around 10, I believe. Yeah. Um, so then, moving into our tiger sharks, which are the lovely sharks that got to bring me back to Buck Island, um, we found that we have two different groups of tiger sharks, really. We have tiger sharks that like to use the north part of our buck array, and we have tiger sharks that use the north part, but also like to run this south side. Um, our tiger sharks are all around the same size that we have tagged, between 8 and 10 feet long, um, which makes them still juveniles, so they're, they're not mature yet, but they're about to be. So they've gotten through that period of time where um, they're small and really vulnerable to predation, and they're almost ready to start contributing to the population again by reproducing. So the fact that they use this MPA is really important to know for their biology um, because they're being protected from fishing here and otherwise they'd be vulnerable to fishing because they're starting to be large enough to be good to eat um, either for their meat or their fins or fun to catch recreationally and harvest. So I'm down here on a trip right now um, funded in part by National Geographic to try to learn more about these tiger sharks. And one thing I want to point out on these slides is what we learned from these tiger sharks was that though they use the marine protected area often, they also go outside regularly. So we've detected our tiger sharks on all of these Lang Bank receivers. Um, we, they've also shown up in the East End Marine Park. Uh, receivers were added around Teague Bay. We've heard from them there. Uh, they're going all over the place. but. This technology that we're using, this acoustic tracking, is limited by how many receivers we have and where we can put them in the water. They can't go really deep because we need to be able to dive to get them. Um, and it's also incredibly time consuming to do array downloads of all of these receivers. So to be able to really understand where these tiger sharks are going when they leave the boundaries of Buck, we needed to use a different technology. You have to dive the up and downloaded? Yes. To get the, the data? Yes. I personally have not done that, but it is a lot of work. You, you should hear them so you can smell them so you can get um, vinegar. It's very enticing. This room, they set up tables and they bring them in. And, you need uh, vinegar to get all the stuff off of it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> is there deployed for, Nate, six, six, six months? months? Yeah. Six months is the deployment. 
So, so we're down here um, with some funding from Nat Geo to try to put a different tracking technology on these tiger sharks. That means we don't have to rely as heavily on those acoustic receivers. And we'll be able to learn where the sharks are going when they leave the marine protected area. And we've been fortunate enough to catch and tag, deploy one of these tags on our trip down. And we still have a couple more days of fishing. We're hoping to get a few more out. But what we're doing, tagging these sharks, is using a, a satellite tracking technology. So we're deploying what are called spot tags on the sharks. I have one to pass around. This is a real tag. It needs to come back to me. It is very expensive. Don't drop it. Very expensive. $100? $500? $3,000. Yeah. Yeah. and make sure it gets back to me. <laughs> it needs to go out on a shark tomorrow. Um, so what we do with that tag is we attach it to their dorsal fin. And so the way that tag works is that every time, you'll see as it goes around, it has an antenna on it. Every time that shark's dorsal fin with the antenna breaks the surface of the water, no matter where in the world that shark is, it will transmit its location to a satellite which will send me an email and tell me where that shark was at that very moment. And so I can then do all of the same things that I just showed you here with the acoustic data and connect the dots, see where they're going, see what habitats are important, see how long they spend in each area. But I can do that wherever they decide to go. So if they decide to s swim out to Sandy Point, uh, we'll know that they're there. If they decide to go up to St. John and St. Thomas, we'll know that they're there or order over to Puerto Rico. We could track them all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. And there have been tiger sharks that have been tracked very far distances across, um, across the Indian Ocean and throughout the Pacific Ocean. So these sharks that are here could go anywhere. And we'll be able to learn that from them with these tags. How often will they surface? Um, so they'll surf it, it depends on the shark, each, each shark is different, just like each pers person is different. Um, but tiger sharks feed on a variety of different things, and as I'm sure a lot of you in the room know, they will eat sea turtles and they will eat sea birds, and those uh, prey items are surface bound, so they need to breathe. Uh, and so usually a tiger shark will come up from the bottom, grab a seabird while it's sitting, uh, resting on the surface of the ocean or sea turtle when it comes up to breathe and that forces them up to the surface to have that dorsal fin break and send uh, that information to me. Does the antenna know it broke the surface of the water? Yes, there are sensors, sensors in the tag and it's able to make a connection with the satellite from that. How long does that battery last? Two years. So what we do um, to tag the shark is we drill a couple holes in the dorsal fin to attach it. Sharks' dorsal fins are not vascularized. It means there's no blood vessels in them. They're made entirely of cartilage, so it feels like an ear piercing. They, they really can't feel it very much. Um, and then, after the tag is attached, we will let them swim away back into the deep blue ocean. And I'm almost done with my talk, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of information that I think is interesting and is a side project that um, arose from this project happening in uh, the monument. I'm sure I don't have to remind you that uh, Hurricane Maria passed by the island in 2017 on September 19th and 20th. Uh, and our receivers were still in the water during that time. And so that provided us with a really interesting and great opportunity to learn about how sharks respond to a Category 5 hurricane, which is something that we uh, really didn't know that much about before. Sharks have been studied a little bit in tropical storms, um, but in more sheltered near shore areas. And so we got to learn about what the sharks were doing during the hurricane in Buck. And so this graph right here just shows you all of the different tagged sharks that were in the water at the time um, from September 18th through September 22nd. This dark bar here is the time when Maria passed by St. Croix. 
And as you can see, we had a number of sharks that were around during the hurricane and a number of sharks that we heard during the worst parts of the hurricane in this great bar, gray bar, because each black dot here is a detection that we received from a shark during the storm. And so I'm just gonna take you through species by species and show you examples of what different individual sharks did um, during the hurricane. So again here, um, I have our map of where our receivers were. The black dots are receivers anchored in the water that the sharks didn't use. And then uh, the other colors that you see here are their movements during different stages of the storm. So these are their movements on the 19th and the 20th. The white is earlier in the day on the 19th when the storm was over 100 kilometers away from St. Croix. And the gray are um, after the storm had passed and made landfall on Puerto Rico. Uh, this is a lemon shark that I'm showing you here. Uh, that yellow and green are as the storm was passing by, but not when the storm was the most intense at around 11 p.m. We didn't hear from uh, the lemon sharks during that time, but we know that they seemed to move a little bit north into deeper water and just kind of hunker down and wait the storm out. But what's really interesting about these lemon sharks is that you can see there's a ton of overlap between those gray and white dots. They go right back to business as usual as, as soon as the storm leaves. And so those that's one of those sharks that swims around and around in circles all day long. It went right back to swimming around and around in circles all day long. Yeah? Um, about the, um, uh, after two years, when the tag dies, does it still keep the information or does it lose all the information? So there are satellite tags that will store information in them, but this tag that we're using that's going around doesn't keep any information inside of it. So it sends all of that information to me through a satellite and into my email inbox. And when the battery runs out, the shark's just stuck with the tag till the tie wraps or something fall off, right? Yeah, so I mean, we use a, a bolt system and they're designed to corrode over time. So after the two year time limit, those bo bolts should corrode and, and fall off. Yeah. All right, so back to hurricanes. Uh, during the hurricane, uh, nurse sharks moved uh, out towards deeper water. They hung out right along this continental shelf drop off. And then once the storm was gone, they made these really interesting exploratory movements along our receivers that were anchored out along the reef outside of Teague Bay. And what I think that they were doing there was uh, foraging. So I think they were looking for food. The uh, storm had incredible wave action, knocked up a lot of stuff from the bottom, probably had a few dead fish out there. Uh, and so they were capitalizing on that opportunity. Caribbean reef sharks also moved out to deeper water, just like the nurse sharks. So this is one of those little Caribbean reefs that likes to go back and forth and back and forth. And then all of a sudden, it tracks out to the deep water. Uh, during, the red is during the worst of the storm. It's in some of our deepest water receivers. And then it cuts right back in and does the same thing that the lemon sharks did, goes right back to business as usual as soon as the storm is gone. Did any of the sharks preempt the storm, or did they just move when the storm got close? A few of them left early, so um, I'm going to transition right into the tiger sharks because they are the ones that left earlier. Um, but part of that might be because the tiger sharks already like to be in deep water, and so they were moving deeper, but we weren't able to track that because they were already on receivers in really deep water, like at the deepest extent of, our, of the receivers that we have. And then after the storm left, the shark showed back up all the way out here at the edge of Lang Bank, uh, and then came back closer to shore uh, as time went on. And another thing that's pretty cool about the sharks in the hurricane is that some of these sharks that we've tracked for years and years went to places that they'd never gone before, even though they've had, we've had receivers there the entire time. So if they had gone there, we would have known, and obviously they've always had access to these places. Um, so again, one of these lemon sharks that likes to swim around in circles moved out to a receiver on the edge of the continental shelf, 
drop off that it had never been to before within the MPA. Uh, we saw, see a similar thing with this Caribbean reef shark moved to receivers along the continental shelf that it had never been to before. And that was after the storm? During the storm. Yeah. And another Caribbean reef shark that we had been tracking for three years moved to an area of the continental shelf that it had never gone to before. So in general, we're seeing that these sharks, like they move out into deeper water, likely to escape the severity of the storm. So if you have access to deeper water, you can go farther down. There's going to be less crazy waves. Uh, you, you're not going to be affected by the wind, uh, and it's a safer spot for them. So that's probably why they're going to deep water. So to wrap things up, we've been studying sharks here for six years. What does buck mean for sharks? We have this high residency time. That means that they're using Buck Island uh, and the marine protected area a lot. And that means that there's important habitats there. And it's really great that we're protecting those habitats because they're important not only to sea turtles and to various reef fish species, but also for our apex predators. We see that the diversity of habitats in Buck Island is really important. So while those sand habitats are important, different species liked other things. So our um, lemon sharks liked that linear reef habitat. Uh, our tiger sharks used the scrus more often than others and the colonized pavement. So it's, it's important to have a diversity of habitats in your marine protected area if you're trying to protect a variety of species. And we have that here in Buck, which is amazing. We found that uh, the space that they use changes with size. So as those sharks got bigger, uh, especially as I showed with the nurse sharks, they started using more and more area. And I also want to point out that the vast majority of the detections that we got from the sharks were in areas that were not protected before the MPA expansion in 2001. So that expansion is really important. It's part of what provided the variety of habitats from the sand and seagrass, as well as corals that were added uh, to the protected area. And um, those spaces are all really important for sharks, and they wouldn't have been protected otherwise. But we also know that there's a lot left to learn about the sharks in St. Croix. That's part of why we're down here with the satellite tags to track the tiger sharks. Um, I'd really love to find out where those big nurse sharks are going someday. So there are whole ton of questions that are left to answer, um, but we know that Buck Island is a really important part of the picture. And with that, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to Clay and Zandi, who are co-authors on my talk. Um, also to everyone from the Park Service who has helped out over the years and contributed to these projects, particularly Ian, Tessa, Nate, Kristen, all the seasonal staff and interns. I know that downloading these receivers is really, really hard work. You've provided me and a number of other researchers with an amazing data set, and we're incredibly grateful for that. And then all of my funders. Um, I'm, my PhD is funded by the Dr. Nancy Foster Scholarship from NOAA, uh, National Park Service, the New England Aquarium, the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy, Puerto Rico Sea Grant, and National Geographic have all contributed to this research, and it wouldn't be possible without them. And with that, I'll take any remaining questions. I have to correct an error of my ways before we get to give Grace some questions. Can my team stand up, please? Because I did not intentionally forget our critical seasonal jade, Reinhardt. But your boss sat over there the whole talk going, Oh my gosh, I forgot Jay. This, this team here has been fantastic this summer. They are going to undertake under Nate's uh, leadership the removal of an enormous amount of the acoustic receivers. We're only keeping the ones in that Grace wants. <laughs> but Jade and Danielle and Aaron both working on the St. Croix Ground Lizard at Buck Island. Kristen is our newest member of the staff along with Jade from this summer. She's a UVI master's student graduate. We're really happy to have her here. And of course, Nathaniel is our lead bioscience tech. So again, thank you very much. Um, and yeah, this, the array is coming. So now ask Grace her <laughs> questions. Yeah. Yes. 
Are you going to be able to, with the dorsal fin tracking with the antenna, will you be able to put those on the Sharktivity app that Greg's phone will use on uh, Cape Cod? I don't know. Why don't we ask Greg? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, oh, really? <laughs> I was just looking at it. Just <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely do that. Oh, great. That's awesome. awesome. I'm excited for that. Good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, so that's on my to-do list. And it's gonna be really interesting to compare how things were different or similar um, because Irma was was farther away, but, but there were still obviously environmental changes that they might be sensing and responding to. So that, that's something that I am going to dig into. You ready? Have you ever tagged a great light? I have not tagged a great white, but there's someone else in this room that has, and maybe he could talk to you after the Q and A. Yeah. You said that Buck Island was a very important habitat, but you don't really know that. It's just that that's where you're looking, right? We do know that because we know that they spend more than fifty percent of their time there. So. But. There could be sharks in Frederickstead that spend 50% of their time in Frederickstead. Well, yes, it's it's an important habitat for these these particular sharks. Okay. Um, but certainly there are other sharks around living in other places, um, and that's you know as I said there are more questions and more things to learn in St. Croix, and that's one of them. Yeah. In the mid mid 70s or the later 70s, I used to go to Island nearly every day. The reef was very much alive then. Uh, we were feeding fish in the trail, so there was a lot more fish. Maybe fish that wouldn't normally be there. Mm -hmm. We were feeding them, but a lot, a lot more fish. I never saw a shark in the trail. Never. That's not to say they were never there, but I was in the water days and days and days in a row. And over many, many years, never saw a shark. Interestingly, <laughs> 10 years ago or so, uh, when I was going to Buck Island, we walked around to the north side, and there was constantly baby sharks out there about this big in yeah. very, very shallow water, just back, back, back. Mm -hmm. Now, since this time, you can go to the trail, and if you go there five times, you might see sharks two or three, yeah. which is really interesting. And the trail is shallow. Whole bunch of sharks would have bite that close. Peter, you remember a good friend of ours, Bob McCullough? Yeah. Well, Bob told me when we were beginning the scoping for the East End Marine Park expansion, he used to love to tell me fish stories. Mm -hmm. Back in the 50s, he and a bunch of fishermen were hired to fish out the sharks to make waters safe. <laughs> there used to be untold hammerheads breeding ground at Green Key National Wildlife Refuge. So I think that it, you know, it, it's just that's a big fish story. But you know, that's something that a student should look into because it was a contract. I mean, I believe what Bob said most of the time. <laughs> you know, but well, obviously that was, they were that trying. Was you know, you remember that guy Castro and Fish yep. said that was also in the 70s, right? In the mid, mid to later part of the 70s. Yep. And he'd just go right outside of uh, 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 Christian Set Harbor. He had this wooden rowboat, flat bottom thing. And he'd set a line overnight and he would drag in big sharks, tear open their bellies, right in front of the King Christian Hotel, right there. <laughs> I remember one time he had a shark and there must be. Maybe is this maybe you cut them out of her belly? There must have been 15 of them. It's a freak people. Well, right also, now. anecdotally, and I've been sharing with Grace some of the anecdotes that our uh, Buck Island captains are sharing with us about shark sightings, about seeing sharks taking turtles. So, our turtle population has kind of been going up a little bit over the years. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things that are changing and enhancing. We also know that Sandy Point, Leatherback population, was not seeing that many shark bites, and that's also increased. And we also know a couple of years ago, they, the fishermen brought in tiger sharks at Sandy Point. So 
So with more are, food around, we may have more sharks. Well, too. these are big, important parts of the marine protected area. And so we can only hope that with their presence, it's indicating to us that we're, we're getting there. We know it's a long road, um, and especially with all the associated ecological impacts that are going on in our environment right now, I'm happy the sharks are utilizing for that. Yes, me too. Mm -hmm. Besides, besides your contact with the sharks, how much contact do the sharks have with humans? Um, it's it's pretty low, so they're you're really quite unlikely to be bitten by a shark. Um, you're more likely to be killed by a cow or a falling vending machine or an exploding toaster. So it's it's a it's a pretty pretty low chance. Yes. Is it possible, I mean, this may not be possible, is it possible for you to look at the data in terms of how the sharks behave when humans are in the area? That would be difficult to do without some additional data, um, but it's probably additional data that I could track down based on uh, the trips that go back and forth. Yeah, we, um, we certainly know when our concessionaires are at the underwater trail, but that period of time is, and Grace and I talked about this sort of recreational question because of course that for us that's like really interesting mm -hmm. um, and we know from the work that was done in the seagrass with the video cameras with with Alex Julik um, that sharks are swimming past our seagrass <coughs> pastures on the south side frequently so that's sort of I mean you know she could get about three or four PhDs out of the data that she's got yeah there's an immense amount of data and, 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 and that's the scary thing is I mean how many millions of detections have we got for all species right now, Nate? I mean, last time it was like 40 million or something. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, we haven't just tagged sharks. We're tagging everything from conch to tiger sharks. Mm -hmm. and a whole array of fish in between and sea turtles. Um, you know, so it's just, you wouldn't believe that grass conch. But anyway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've seen it. It's actually it crazy. crazy. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, a massive quality of data. She literally could do multiple PhDs. Yes. This is really elementary. What yeah. makes that area that you're talking about with all of the sharks, what makes it protected? Well, obviously not walls around it, but what makes it protected? What do you think you actually have a shape to it? What well, so, so that's the um, the boundary of the marine protected area. So that, that was set by um, <laughs> the powers that really, like <laughs> Oh, no, certainly, no, certainly food. they leave. Okay. Um, we, we don't have many receivers outside because it's it's hard to have receivers cover such a large area. So, so the boundaries of Buck Island are, are very large. I can tell you it's 77 square kilometers because I'm a scientist and I have to work on the metric system. I don't remember what that is in the conversion, but it's a, it's a huge area that we're covering with this array. Um, having more outs receivers outside would be great so that we could know where they were outside, but you, you work with the resources that you have. I guess what I meant was, okay, I know what I meant, but it's, it's explaining it. What key, what? Hmm. Why do they spend so much time there? Or the only protection we're providing them right now, Susan, yeah. is the fact that fishermen have agreed to not illegally fish. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Well, I got it. <laughs> so in so two, 2001, thing. 2001, okay. Buck Island was expanded. In 2003, we put in place the interim regulations that said no fishing, which is another reason why a lot of folks get distressed because if they've gone deep sea fishing outside of Buck Island and then they want to come back to Buck to have their picnic or fry their fish, they still have fishing gear on, which makes it impossible for the rangers to know. So if you have fishing gear in the park, please don't. The rangers are going to assume that you've been fishing in the park. Regardless of whether it's wet or dry, just don't go there. Um, so that was the deal. And Buck Island is our fully protected marine area, but it is just a piece of the larger East End Marine Park. And, and so it doesn't mean it's perfect. We certainly know we have illegal fishers. We are teams out there frequently seeing it and then trying to work with our rangers and 
you know, do the education, do the refreshing, you know, heck, chase the fishermen out of the park. Um, I think just yesterday they pulled a couple of fish traps illegally set in the park. So, you know. Is that Marine Park or Buck Island Park? You know, but it's, if it's working, I mean, anecdotally, as a scientist, I get a lot of good, as, as, a, as, a, as a St. Croix resident, I get a lot of good stories. One really good story was from Mike Evans, Fish and Wildlife Service, had talked to a fisherman who was explaining to him that Buck Island is working. And so Mike had to tell me, he said, Sandy, the fishermen are actually figuring out that if they're on the northwest side, outside the boundary, at the drop-off, they're getting big fish again. Oh, you know, that's, to me, that's invaluable information, that a fisherman who understands fishing better than any scientist ever will, is recognizing the value of saying, not here, go over here. It's that spillover. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're waiting to see. Is this going to improve Teague Bay? Is this going to improve where they're fishing? All oh, blind banking. Exactly. Well, that's kind well, of interesting. You know, yeah. but, but we know from some of the fish work that we're doing, with Old Wife, is that those guys are moving out the Lang Bank and breeding and then coming back to Buck. I mean, Nate could talk to you a lot more about that stuff, but we'll do a, we'll do sort of an array update. I think Clayton did one not too long ago, but we'll have, it's massive. Um, and there will someday be a, a, a big report that comes out on the whole thing, but yeah. Sandy, what other animals are you using these acoustic arrays to trap? Nathaniel? Uh, Kong, Trump, yeah. We've had tags implanted or put on the shelves at Kong, sea turtles, tropical reef fish, um, sharks, all sorts of different. Yellowtail, barracuda, they give off a different or white. Yeah. So yeah, each transmitter has a unique ping that is uh, associated with that animal. So that's how you can identify. Can you can you say the list of fish? Because it's been yellowtail. Barracuda. Well, I, I don't know all of them, but yeah, yellowtail, barracuda, jack. lionfish. Horsehead jack, lionfish. Um, <laughs> I think that they got a lionfish. They come in different the sizes. The tags come in all different oh. sizes. Yep. So you can have little ones. They don't last quite as long because the battery's much smaller. Um, but yeah, they come in all, all different sizes. Speaking of the tags, where is my tag? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, boss man's got it, that's good. Huh? <laughs> so do you expect uh, these sharks to migrate to travel great distances now that you direct on satellite? They could. Uh, we, we don't entirely know what we're going to learn um, from these sharks. We know that they leave. Uh, they may just go to other areas of St. Croix, um, but it, Certainly, especially the larger sharks could go quite far away. So, well, it's a bit of a mystery. So, so tiger sharks haven't really been tracked in the Virgin Islands. Um, they've been tagged with this kind of technology in the Bahamas, and we know that they tend to go up um, along coastal Florida and the east coast of mainland U.S. Um, they don't really seem to come south. So, we don't really know what these more southerly Caribbean tiger sharks will do. Yeah. Um, have you ever almost had something that you weren't supposed to tag? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I mean, we, we've caught things that we're not trying to tag. So, so on this trip, we've caught some Caribbean reef sharks. We're not interested in tagging them, so we just let them go. Um, but I've never almost tagged something that I wasn't looking for. The tags are expensive, so I like to put them in the things that I'm really interested in. Your, your new tag, your satellite tag, mm -hmm. is your study going to try to focus on getting those satellite tags on sharks that they have already got the acoustic tags on them? So we've talked about that on the boat. That would be amazing if we could catch one of our already acoustically tagged sharks and put a satellite tag on it. We do have acoustic tags down with us as well. So all of the sharks that we're catching are also getting one of those acoustic tags. Um, and as Zandy said, we are leaving some receivers in the water, though, though the majority of the array is, is closing <coughs> down. So we'll still get those nice fine scale movements within 
buck from the receivers that we need as well as the broader movements. But it certainly would be amazing to be able to combine that his historic data set that I have from the RA tag sharks, but it would be, you know, it's hard to catch it's hard to catch a shark in general. It's it's really hard to catch that one specific shark. <laughs> Yeah, the only way you could tell is by seeing the scar, unless you had a we put, that you could ping it. Yes, yeah, so so um, there are they're called hydrophones that you can use to determine if there's a tag inside. We also put an external just numbered tag on them, so if we recapture them, we can we can read that number. So if anyone has one last question, the Rangers are waiting for us to come back to the parking lot. Go ahead. So would you class this area as a breeding and nursery ground, like we've got up in New York, where the no now of Monzo, you have a nursery ground for great whites. Same as you have in Massachusetts, you have a nursery ground for great whites. Mm -hmm. Would you class this as a nursery, or and as a no population? So nursery is is a very specific scientific term um, when it comes to a shark a shark nursery. There are several criteria that it needs to meet. Um, you have to have uh, young, so year old or less than a year old individuals using it all the time. Though some, of, though most of our sharks are are immature, um, they're not necessarily all that young. Uh, you also have to have repeated data from little sharks year after year after year, uh, and certainly. It appears that this area is very important for young lemon sharks. The sharks that you were talking about swimming by on the north end of the lagoon in super shallow water were most likely young lemon sharks. Uh, we need to do a little bit more research to meet that true scientific definition. Um, it would involve coming and doing longer term annual surveys during that time of year when, when those little sharks are pupped. Um, but it's, it's likely likely a, a nursery for lemons at least okay uh